Okay, uh, so basically, the Bluetooth SIG is basically playing around with a new security model for Bluetooth since, uh, let me guess, something one and a half years. And half a year ago, that. Okay, this works. That works now. Is this enough? That well, should be enough. Good. Uh, so the Bluetooth SIG is playing with a new security model since one and a half years now, and since half a year they have a new specification around that's available. And I'm going to go a little bit over the details, what they've done, what they're doing, what they try to solve, what, under my opinion, they did wrong, and what we're going to see with it when it comes out. Actually, this is totally annoying. This is the only problem with your first speaker in the morning and this room hasn't been used. Never mind. Okay. So, uh, besides the new security model, they ended up, okay, we need something to make it clear what a device can do and what a device can't do. So they have these nice number of icons, which ends up, okay, yeah. The left one is basically, okay, you can use a keyboard or a mouse and you know, see, okay, this will work. Second one is you can play high quality audio, great. The third one is the kind of headset, it's kind of lame. The uh, fourth one is a printer and the fifth one is file transfer. Uh, the best one is actually that the mouse has a cable. We're talking about a wireless technology and a, when you ask them, oh yeah, otherwise nobody will realize that that's a mouse. But never mind. So anyway, if you talk about security, they look a little bit differently. Uh, and at some point we have to actually tag devices with these kind of icons in case of their security implementation. But that's just as a side note. Okay, uh, to see the difference between the security uh, design in the old specifications and the new 2.1 actually go quickly over what they currently have done. They have three security modes. I'm going to go that into them a little bit in detail on a later slide. Uh, they had the problem that they had basically when Bluetooth came out, which is around 99, they had the problem is the chips were kind of slow, they had limited resources and so they had to invent a lot of stuff by themselves meaning they invented their own encryption algorithm and they used safer plus and modified it a little bit so that it's not reversible. Uh, they stuck with 128 bit for the encryption keys which is actually perfectly fine since we're talking about small devices that actually move and you don't want to really protect something like really trade secrets or whatever. Anyway, uh, the interesting part, they have a handshake pin code basically which is one or 16 bytes long which is kind of strange so actually you can define the size um, and you end up with an 128 bit encryption link key that gives you the authentication and will be used for the encrypting the link between two devices. Um, the good thing is they did, they separated the host operating system interface from the link manager that actually does the encryption for you uh, which you see on this slide basically they separate everything so what you have on the lower layers, that's a piece of hardware, which is a Bluetooth dongle, Bluetooth chip that you build in your phone, etc. That does all the crypto algorithm, that does all the authentication, that basically does everything. Uh, on top of it, you have the host security, which basically is, oh, I have to pop up a dialog and ask the user for a pin. That's all what the host stack basically has to do. And then on top of it, you have applications that say, okay, yeah, but that's not secure enough, so I'd use SSL, TLS, or whatever on top of it, but it's basically their choice. But all the hard part is done in the hardware, so basically whatever host stack you use, they can't do it wrong. The only exception is we've seen that they did it wrong. Probably everybody remembers the uh, Nokia 6310 phone which actually screwed up totally. Um, I forgot one to mention, the host stack has to actually decide when to enable the authentication and encryption since there are still some use cases where you don't want to have an authentication and encryption, especially do you want to do an anonymous transaction, etc. Um, with the old security model, they had three security modes, which was basically not a bad idea in the beginning when they designed it. So security mode one was basically, okay, we don't do any security, except the other side wants it. Which means uh, if the other side decides to have to do any security, meaning authentication or encryption or both, they have to follow it. So otherwise they don't have any connection. Which doesn't mean, which basically means one side says, I don't want to do security, and the other side says, okay, I go along with it. Doesn't work this way. If one side wants security, then they have to uh, agree on it, which is a bad 
uh, foundation to start with. Uh, security number two was, okay, we basically go without security but if you have a service like uh, uh, synchronization profile where you can sync your contact database and so on, yeah then we have to do authentication and then we do have to do encryption later on. That uh, sounds reasonable. Uh, basically which means it based on uh, security mode one, so security mode two is an extension. Uh, the only big problem then is ended up okay then we do security mode three. We always authenticate and we always encrypt and we do this on the chip level so the host tech don't has to do anything. Uh, for some reason this mode ended up with being okay this is the most secure mode uh, and the specification was written that way. It said it literally which was simply plain wrong because then you trick somebody into an authentication and into an encryption, tell them you do a business card exchange and but you actually read the complete phone book and they don't even know it. Uh, it took something like four years to tell the Bluetooth stick actually to change this and to remove this phrase from the specification and in the end deprecating that mode. Okay, so this is the piece of thing that the host tech has to do with a Bluetooth 2.0 or earlier device. You get a request, I want, I need a pin code. Uh, you pop up your dialog, user enters pin code, you send the pin code back to the chip and then you get a link key. That's it. You store the link key for, fu for future juice. It's basically 16 byte, 128 bit. So next time you come in, uh, the chip asks, oh I need a link key. Oh yeah, I have one. I've stored this safely in my uh, Windows registry or on a Linux on the file system or somewhere else. Oh yeah, here. And they say, okay, you're connected, you're authenticated, you can enable encryption and so on and so forth. Sounds pretty simple. Nokia screwed that up initially, Sony Ericsson screwed that up and a lot of companies did this really wrong because if you don't tell them that you want to have a secure link then basically this transaction never happens and you go unauthenticated. I think it's quite clear to everybody. Who has any misunderstandings how this works? Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Okay. So, we had a couple of issues with this model. Uh, especially you have to enter the pin code. How are you going to do this on a headset or on a mouse for example? Any good ideas? We came up with Morse codes but then you have the usability people say, ah, not so many people can do Morse codes and it looks kind of stupid if you have to enter a 16 digit pin uh, on a mouse. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did So it doesn't work that well. So what it ended up is these devices like headsets, uh, uh, mouse, and all the other small devices which have basically no keyboard or no input facility ended up with they use fixed pins. Okay, uh, uh, let me put it this way. A headset that has a fixed pin is always visible, is always connectable and you can always pair to it. There's another word for this one. Does anybody know? Uh, we call in the uh, intelligence business you would call this a bug yet yeah, but basically you're right. It's a perfect thing. So basically you end up, oh, oh you're nice CEO, I have a nice present for you. Here take this headset and go into your special meeting where you're going to sell your company and sit next room and uh, hear everything about it. So let me put it this way. I had a company that wanted to actually sell one of these and they said no, no, there's no security issue and then we ended up okay sitting next to them and actually con recording one of their conversation and playing that back to the one guy that was in charge at that event. He got a little bit scared. Um, the other issue what we and actually what not uh, what some people end up with the pin codes that were used could be brute forced in the end up to something like eight digits. So if you have an eight digit or less pin code you ended up with something like two or three seconds to brute force uh, the pin code and region and uh, create the linky out of it. So it was not really secure enough. Uh, welcome to my screen saver. Um, the other thing which was basically design flaw, the link keys that you get have no expiration date. You never have to renew them. So once you're paired with one device, you're paired for that device with life, for the life, except you lose your link key. It's kind of, okay, they should at least be renewed at some time. Uh, some devices were going in a way, there is a way to update the link key and create a new one. Some devices were actually starting using it. Uh, but the majority of the Bluetooth stacks and Bluetooth devices were not, so the link keys were valid forever. Which means if you get hold of this link key, uh, however, and then you have the Bluetooth address of the other side, you, pin, you have basically you can create a perfect clone of the device and access all information. Um, the other thing that's basically unknown is the unit keys. 
there were unit keys for the early days which got, okay, we have a fixed unit key in the device, another key in that device and they are uh, bond together so they can always communicate in a secure way. Um, the unit, key, unit keys got deprecated a little lot earlier and some devices don't even support them anymore. Uh, what you currently see is called combination keys. Um, the other thing, potential reply attacks. Yes, you can actually, if you can sniff a connection and see the data, you can try to reply it and then uh, get access to the devices. It's not protected against uh, men in the middle and other things. Uh, some devices don't implement pairing mode, which is kind of not obvious, but the initial specification said, okay, if you want to do a pairing, you have to press a button or uh, say something that you're explicitly in pairing mode. Uh, this got removed by most manufacturers because of usability features because it was too hard to tell them, okay, you have to press this button of the headset for three seconds, otherwise you can't pair again. So they simply said, okay, that's not usable for the normal user, it's too complicated. Um, the authentication abuse I actually men uh, mentioned a little bit. So once you have uh, the link keys or the security for all Bluetooth devices are per device, not per service. Even if you have security modes two, which is service level security, you only generate one link key and it's valid between two devices. So once you have access to device, you have access to every service except you implement further authorization. And I mentioned before, security mode three is not the safest, whatever the specification says. Okay, that's the basic design issues. Then we have implementation issues. I think everybody heard about Blue Snarf and Blue Buck, the original attacks, something around 2004. Who haven't? Good. Actually, the, good, the funny thing was this, I think Blue Snarf even made it into one English dictionary in the end, so it is dictionary, but it's totally ridiculous. Um, the other thing, backdoor and social hacking were actually really simple because it was too complicated that people had no idea what they were doing and they got talk to that, okay, press four times zero, then hit enter and that will work in 99% of the times. So that's what they're doing. Even if someone totally malicious attacker comes along and says, okay, please give me access. Oh yeah, that we have to do four times zero, enter. And you get away with it. Um, some companies have basically no idea how Bluetooth worked. Uh, they're getting better, uh, but initially they were thinking it's kind of infrared and we have it now over the, uh, uh, with wireless technology, with radio technology instead of something else and there's, uh, still we have to put the devices inside and we only can be 10 meters away and not, it will not work over a mile and stuff like that. And you probably have seen all the tests we've done where we actually spent and uh, put in a direct antenna to it and then you can do attacks over one and one mile and stuff like that. So. The mind changes in these companies but changes slowly. <coughs> so, we do want to address this problem and the Bluetooth SIG decided, okay, and finally they, okay, we do something. Uh, it took them way too long to realize that they have to fix this. Uh, the only problem is the Bluetooth specification is written always in a way that is completely backward compatible, which is kind of tricky and we will see how tricky that is. Uh, they wanted to do something fancy since they wanted to improve usability. So they want to do, if we put two devices close enough to together, then they're basically automatically paired. So if I take my phone and take uh, my computer, I simply have to put the phone on the computer and they will be paired. Um, let me put it with there. Let me put it this way. Uh, I have no idea when this will actually come to the market, but they're playing with this for something like two years now and haven't seen only prototypes and the best prototype they came up with is you take your picture with your phone and then you hold it to, uh, to a frame and then it transfers the image to the frame and then you can display it and say, woohoo, I don't need any security for that, I don't care about that. It's basically, yeah, I want to have this picture on my frame and if somebody changes the picture on that frame at my home, yeah, they have to be so close that they have to break first in your host and then they go something, uh, yeah, maybe I steal something instead of only changing the picture. Uh, never mind. It should be easy for the end user. They really want to make it easy and, but on the other hand it should be secure, which means just putting two devices together should be more secure than what we currently have. Kind of tricky. Okay, which ends up, we have to fight with usability, security and complexity and that's basically unsolvable. Okay, usability says pin code entering or passkey entering is not intuitive. Pff, I agree with that. I don't want to enter a number. Uh, I mentioned mouse, headset. Some devices you can't actually enter a pin code. So, yeah, we have to figure out how to do, deal with them. Security. Oh, the new method should be more secure. 
they had at least a good attention. Uh, it should be extendable so we can do something like NFC or some fancy method or if you plug in a cable first then you pair yourself automatically and stuff like that. Uh, as I say, the ultimate security in this case probably doesn't exist if you have usability in your other mind uh, because it increases that much the complexity which ends to my last point that people will screw it up. Uh, and I go over a couple of slides now and the model gets a little bit more weird when you go with that. Okay. They kept the word pairing for some reason and called it simple pairing. Uh, at some point they realized, okay, simple pairing is from a marketing perspective bad. So they ended up, oh, we have to call it secure simple pairing. Never mind. Uh, the good thing is actually they went on their roots and said, okay, what do we have? in the security business that actually works. So they went up elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Okay, that's nice. At least public key exchange instead of their homegrown stuff. They have a passive eavesdropping protection and an optional man in the middle protection. The eavesdropping protection is mandatory. You can't switch it off. The man in the middle is uh, optional because sometimes, because they wanted to have two models. It just works. So you put devices together without any user input and then you have a more, uh, more security than you currently have with a user input. But if you have user input so the user uh, confirms a pin code, enters a pin code or you have some external mechanism then you can have an additional, additional man in the middle protection. Well, it's not a bad idea. Uh, the encryption is still on the chip which is good. So nobody in the host deck business can actually screw up the uh, encryption algorithm and in, uh, make their bugs uh, and include bugs or weak implementations or whatever. Uh, they ended up something like IO capabilities. I have a couple of slides for that that go that in detail which means maybe okay the device tells you if they have a keyboard for a pin code input, if they have a display to show pin code or stuff like that. They stuck with the security mode concept. I told them a year ago they should simply deprecate all security modes and have a nice chapter about how security should be done. No, they had a new one which is called security mode 4 now. But never mind. Okay, IO capabilities. Uh, the basic idea is a device tells the other device what they can do. If they have an input device, so keyboard or keypad or whatever, or if they have an output capability so it can display actually something. So a keyboard for example has an input capability, uh, a mouse has no input and no output capability, but a computer basically has input and output capabilities and is a display like a picture frame has only a display capability and stuff like that. So they separate these and based on these informations they pick a different algorithm. The first one is numeric comparison. So both sides display a number and you compare this number and say yes they match. Uh, you have a passkey input like before. So one side asks you for a passkey and then you can input it. It has a slight variation. So there are two ways. Both sides has to enter the same pin code or one side displays a pin code and you have to type it on the other side which is kind of nice. For example if you want to put your keyboard to your computer so the computer displays a pin code and then you only have to type it on your computer and then you are paired which is kind of nice. Uh, the third one is out of band so like near field communication you put two devices close enough together and then you can basically be paired and it's, it's meant for NFC communication but it can be reused for something different. The thing that they didn't do is cable based authentication. Uh, if you heard about wireless USB, wireless USB basically works you have to put in the device via cable first and then you can use it wireless. Of course Bluetooth is a complete wireless technology from the beginning so the cable based authentication got removed from the spec because of marketing reasons because otherwise it's a cable technology again. Uh, never mind but with the out of band mechanism you can actually implement a cable based authentication on top of it so it's kind of tricky. Uh, hello? Next? Not again, come on. Okay. So, the specification is kind of clear how you map the IO capabilities. So basically they have this nice chart where you end up, okay, oops, uh, don't kill myself, uh, where you have the no in input, you can have a yes, no or you have a keyboard. So they separate between the uh, uh, input capability if you have two buttons or if you have a full keyboard which means if you have a full keyboard you can enter actually f uh, a pin when you only have a yes no button you can only confirm that uh, the pin code is correct or not correct. Uh, for the uh, output part you basically have no output so you have no display like a keyboard or you can display actually a numeric number that somebody has to type. 
Um, and in the end, they ended up, okay, the numeric number is uh, only four digits since that's enough entropy to actually create a most uh, secure enough linky for the authentication and encryption. Okay, any questions for that so far? It's kind of a lot of information up front. And now there are a lot of more is coming. And this is how the new security architecture looks like. Yeah, you who. Uh, they made it a little bit more complex, but in the end it boils down uh, what, which way you're actually going to do. So Bluetooth inband describes basically that you do the uh, uh, pairing with uh, a numeric comparison or passkey input, while the out of band actually uh, has multiple ways to actually do it while you discover the information, while you have the information up front and so on and so forth, which makes the model kind of complex. Let me put it this way, I don't expect to see really out of band devices in the really near future. They have to solve first the in band stuff to get that right before they're going to actually do the out of band stuff and think about it. <laughs> I have this slide in the presentation, you can basically grab it from the specification but once you see the specification you get kind of scared. This is basically what it boils down and then you have the different ways, numeric comparison, pass key entry, other just works models if you don't have any information and it is kind of stacked. So you can initially have a just works with a weak link key and after that you can update your link key with a pass key or numeric comparison to make it more secure. So the example for that one is basically you connect to other device and you have no idea what you're going to use on that device but you want to have it more secure so you want to have authentication and encryption. But you don't have any information if they have a display attached or if the service needs a man in the middle protection or whatsoever. So basically connect to it, you do just works which will give you the Diffie-Hellman public key exchange and uh, the passive eavesdropping, eavesdropping protection. But then you want to use a service like I want to synchronize my phone book. So you want to be protected against man in the middle then you have to update your link key with a numeric comparison or pass key uh, authentication. Uh, works pretty well but it's kind of makes it more and more complex all over time. Any questions to this diagram? I answer them happily but otherwise I simply go to the next slide. Are you scared? <laughs> Confused? Okay. <laughs> um, as I said, initially the link key was basically everything and the combination key, I mentioned that, that's the basic link key, then they had the local unit key and remote unit key. Both are deprecated but they're still in the spec. And okay, we have this new security model and we have to differentiate the link key because we can't tell what link key it is. So they have the new types like a uh, debug combination key, I'm going to go on the debug combination key a little bit later. Unauthenticated combination key, that's basically what you get if you do just works. And authenticated combination key if you do pass key entry or numeric comparison. And a change combination key if you have used an authentication uh, combination key and changed it so you update it over time. And all of these link keys have, have different implications on when you have to drop them, when you can use them and what you can do with them. So basically the debug combination key should only stay in memory. The unauthenticated combination key needs to be updated once you need a higher security level. So means you can store it but you shouldn't store it since you can always regenerate them in time since it, ha it requires no user interaction. The authenticated combination key, however, yeah, that's a real one that you want to keep because otherwise you have to do the pass key entry or the numeric comparison again. And the change combination key is, yeah, what do we do if we don't actually know from what the change came? Okay, more confused? Yeah, I was initially completely. Um, let me put it this way, they have another nice slide which actually tells you what you have to do and sometimes what you can do. It is not clear if your security requirement from your application is not enough what the stack actually is doing. And just for the fun of it, and I want to show my sliding windows, uh, this spec goes into something like generic access profile, security aspects, security modes, yada 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 yada. Let me just see if we find this one. And then you go into these kind of graphics on the right. And that's not the only one, there's another one. Uh, and they have a couple of more. And there are a couple of more, even with reds written in there and whatever. 
and more and more and more. Uh, if you want to ruin your weekend, just have a look at them and try to understand them. They are really complex and mainly they are so complex because they have to take care of the other devices, not a 2.1 device and can't do uh, any kind of advanced simple pairing. So you basically have a lot of things to take care of and do it right, and make the right decisions. Um, the specification is basically designed as a complete state machine but they, don't, they have a state machine that needs at least something like four pages on a Dean A4 to describe it. So how can the programmers actually get it right in the first step? Uh, anyway, um, depending on the link type you have to do different decisions if you have to update your security or if you uh, get a connection request from an unauthenticated device etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, some interesting things is automatically initiate pairing, uh, uh, automatically update your pairing, notify the user uh, or pick whatever you want to do and stuff like that. None of them actually speaks about when you have to disconnect the device because the security requirement is not enough. Which is kind of, I, I think it's a weak spot in the specification at the moment. So my phrase is, there's nothing simple when it comes to secure simple pairing. The word simple isn't there. It's the word simple it makes no sense. It's marketing crap. The word secure is marketing crap because simple was sounded not secure enough. So we have a lot of stuff they, they built around the word pairing for no obvious reasons. Okay, the only good thing is uh, it is more secure than the current model, even with only just works. It is harder to get into the connection, it's harder to spoof the connection. Uh, so, and the main reason, since they always enable uh, QoT, meaning authentication and encryption, it is definitely a way in the right direction. The only problem is if you want to have the real security, it's getting a little bit more complex. Uh, and I just sat down a couple of uh, minutes ago and actually draw this small graphics. So basically the legacy pairing looks like this. We have this big chunk of cryptographic information, authentication technologies, key handling and so on. That's just some Bluetooth chip. We have a little bit in the host tech, you see they have to open the dialogue, store the link key, etc. And we have an application that actually have to decide if they want to do security or not. Okay, that's pretty simple. Uh, once you go into simple pairing, you put a little more technology in the chip. Okay, the chip manufacturers are not too bad. They most times they know what they're doing. Then you basically double the information you have to deal in the host stack with and you even increase the information in the application because the application has to know, okay, what's the current security situation? Do I have to update it? Uh, what information I have to tell them? Do I want to have a man in the middle protection? Do I want these? Do I want that? So they double ev in every place instead of making it really simple in one place but they put the pressure on this. And the biggest problem is the host stack to get it actually right since that's separating the applications uh, from uh, the Bluetooth chip and making having the uh, my, uh, major attack vectors. Okay, you just saw basically how the uh, legacy pairing works. This is a secure simple pairing uh, with user confirmation where the basic user gets a pin code on both sides and have to say yes or no. Um, let me put you through this. Basically they exchange the IO capabilities, yada, 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 yada. And then they have their confirmation request, then they have your passcode and then the, uh, the uh, host stack has to display this passcode somewhere and then they have to wait uh, for the confirmation for it and this has to happen on both sides and in the end you finally get your link key which you got initially. In this case you have the authenticated combination key which is the most secure link key you can get. Uh, and let me put it this way. This is the simplest version of simple pairing in its implementation way. If you go in that you have a just works model where you have to reject the previous link key because it's not secure enough and then you have to do this again and so on and so forth and not even speaking about the IO capabilities since sometimes you have a keyboard attached then you could an input a pin, sometimes you don't. You have to check the IO capabilities, you have to match your security requirements and so on and so forth. Okay. Any got any scoops when I said it has a debug mode? <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. So uh, the problem with the secure simple pairing is it's too good. From a cryptographic standpoint it's too good and it's too good for the protocol analyzers and the companies that make money with their protocol analyzers to sniff connections between devices have a big problem. They can't anymore. 
So I said, yeah, whatever, who cares? Uh, the Bluetooth stick decided, okay, we have to play nice with them. So then, okay, we have a debug mode. A debug mode basically defines predefined keys in the cryptographic sequence that are known to the chip will enter the debug mode. Okay, it's fair enough. So if you know if you see these keys, then you have a debug connection and then you have to deal with it. I said, okay, it's fine. Both sides say we are now debugging, not a big deal. Um, the only problem is it ended up the on, not only the chip has to know about them, also the host stack has to deal with them, which means the host stack sees these debug keys, which is kind of bad since they have to do the right handling. If you trust a debug key, then you basically trust a debug key. But then they said, I said, okay, if one device then gets out of debug mode, then the debug keys gets invalid. Wrong. The specification says only one side has to enter the debug mode and the other side has to follow, which kind of, why? And yeah, because we have to, it's complicated with the UI on the headsets to actually sell them to debug mode. You're debugging something. If they have to press a Morse code to get into debug mode, I don't care. It's not for general use, it's for the engineers. No, nope, they want it easy for everybody. So remember, for any implement people that implement a host stack, you really have to take the debug, code se debug link key seriously because they are big security risk. Uh, I tried to tell them that's wrong and I don't care, but they ended up, this is the specification how it stands today. Oh, and by the way, I've seen some chips, some early chips that got confused once you have enabled debug mode and then switch out of debug mode, then they still produce debug keys all over. But never mind. But that's probably fixed by now. Okay. Bluetooth 2.1 is out since middle of the year. I haven't seen any device so far and every time I speak to actually uh, companies that work on Bluetooth 2.1 stacks and Bluetooth 2.1 wises, they are scared. They don't want to put it out on the market. Nobody wants to go first. Uh, they're testing interop with old devices and they're testing the complete functionality and they have a big problem. Um, the chip manufacturers have all 2.1 ready chips but none of them is actually uh, really selling them. I think CSR is selling some of them but I haven't seen that in any product and they even don't have a firmware release they consider uh, the, from the quality wise stable enough to actually do it and announce it officially. Microsoft has a stack, Broadcom has a stack which supports 2.1. They both are not convinced that they're going to release it so I don't know what happens. Apple is not doing it at all what I know from a current standpoint. Uh, the Linux side is fun since the first stack I had ready something a year ago then the Bluetooth stick decided to change the specification completely so that implementation was invalid. Then I tried it again with a beta specification it ended up being full of security holes when I did the audit on it and currently I'm working on the third generation of the Bluetooth 2.1 implementation to get it actually right and I have no idea when it will be ready for uh, mainline consumptions. So I have no idea when we see the first devices. My guess is a keyboard, a really simple keyboard would be the first device we're going to see but who knows. Okay, just to sum up the possible issues which 2.1 involves. The debug mode, it's a big one. I, if that goes screwed up then you basically have really weak devices. The interop with old devices has such a high priority in the whole specification that uh, I don't know if they always get this right. As I showed the complexity gets more in the host stack so and you know what happens if manufacturers have to do all them by themselves, they screwed up. They screwed up even with the older Bluetooth profiles which was pretty simple and now they have to do even more to make it secure. I don't know. Uh, the higher level protocols actually can do security evaluation and change the behavior, what they have to do again, etc, etc. Uh, I mentioned it, the missing I.O. capabilities don't enforce a disconnect or rejection so you basically can get away with it and expect a authenticated combination key but in the end you get an unauthenticated combination key and you go along and you are basically not protected against man in the middle attacks which is kind of okay if you want that protection and the other side can't uh, surf it then you basically have to disconnect. But then you go again the usability. Oh no we can't disconnect because the reason is not available, not easy to display to the user, whatever. Um, the specification changed in the last months before it was released so many times and, it's still, and it still changes because of the additional erratas because they did the wording wrong, they had ambiguity in some of the uh, paragraphs and so on and so forth. So it's, you really have to look closely to see what you have to do if you deal with it. Um, okay, 3.0 and later. It's fun, it gets better and better. 
So at some point 2.1 is the should be the standard for doing uh, security within Bluetooth and it, it's pretty good standard once we get the whole stack implementations right which I currently doubt that it will happen anytime soon so at least another two years. So uh, 3.0 is for targeted for the end of next year. It will introduce something that's called AMP, alternate Mac and file layer. So they wanted to go high speed and decided okay yeah we don't do our own radio again so we use either ultra wideband or IEEE 802.11. The interesting part is both come with their own security models because you have to, we can protect the uh, Bluetooth radio quite good but if you do ultra wideband or uh, Wi-Fi you have to protect that too and we know in the Wi-Fi case how that worked out uh, and they're working on their own security models to protect the Wi-Fi link uh, and the ultra wideband link and they will end up in having additional link keys that can be used with the Bluetooth stack. So. It's all work in progress, they're discussing it for us and back. Uh, but at some point there are too many Wi-Fi companies that have no idea how security works are actually making proposals which you see, uh, okay, that's simply wrong, that won't work. Never mind. Ultra low power, aka Vibri. So Nokia did the smart move and sold it to the Bluetooth 6, so the Bluetooth 6 has no deal with it to make a proper specification out of it. It's 2.4 gigahertz radio, but it's totally different baseband. Calling it Bluetooth is absolutely wrong because it has nothing to do with Bluetooth. It's some whipped up a radio protocol designed in some uh, Nokia research center in Helsinki designed by people that get paid for doing weird stuff and now they try to make a product out of it. It is really that way. Uh, the security is kind of the same as this with Zigbee. Oh, we do this later. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It is this way. Uh, I would never put this on a slide but basically there was something, okay we have to do a protection there and we use some uh, checksum algorithm, yada yada yada. Uh, guys, you can actually brute force this, it takes something like two hours. Okay, then we double the bit rate. Uh, that's not what I meant, it only takes longer and I can do it in a week but it takes probably two weeks or something like that. I'm not kidding, they are thinking about stuff like that but uh, I hope that at some point they get some sense into it and say okay we have to be at least same secure as 2.1 will do so they have to do something. Uh, a lot of people say ultra low power is not even needed but that's a marketing requirement for some more chips to sell or whatever and most companies don't even want to do ultra low power they only do it because Nokia pays for it. Never mind. Okay, conclusions. Since I probably have more than five minutes less so I'm not that bad in time. Bluetooth 2.1 is a big step in the right direction. The only problem is the big companies have to get it right. So we have to get a Linux stack that works perfectly, we have to get the Microsoft stack working perfectly and once Apple and other companies jump on it and actually uh, have stacks they have to work. Um, the only problem with that is there are no security audits for what actually comes out of it. The Bluetooth stick has this big testing and qualification and so on but they don't check if the security actually works, they check basic functionality. That's a big problem and there's no plans what I've seen that they're going to do this. Uh, the big complexity of the new design is always a problem and the bigger, the more complex the uh, specification gets, the more cases you actually screw it up and this is what I expect to see happen. Um, there are no really easy use cases that can be generalized. So basically for all the implementers of a host stack that runs on a desktop PC on an embedded system can be used for different cases, for different scenarios, they have a hard time to get this right. If I have to design a keyboard, that's simple. If I have to design a headset, that's simple. If I have to design a multi-purpose stack, then the problem uh, comes up and that's basically what the Linux side has to do, what Microsoft has to do, what Apple has to do and I'm not really looking forward in finding out what actually works and what doesn't work. Okay, that's from my talk. There was a donkey at some point from the usability issues which is kind of nice story but I open this for questions now. Go ahead. Uh, the shaking? You want me to speak about the shaking part? Okay. Okay. He just mentioned about the. I think it was last week's. It goes to all the new stickers and was on YouTube. They had a new way to do actually the pairing. Basically, it's kind of out of band mechanism. So you take your phone and probably another phone. Clip borrow your phone. 
And you do something like this long enough and then it's paired because they shake in a basic uh, same frequency and that's enough to pair. Actually, the idea is nice. Um, we will see. It's definitely with uh, 2.1 it's possible to implement this kind of out-of-band algorithm to do it. Uh, I have no idea if they're going to do it. If someone's accepting them or if you people see pairing and sitting in the airport and pairing their devices, I don't know. Yeah, he mentioned that you need additional hardware. The phones always get a motion sensor nowadays. The Open Moco gets a uh, motion sensor, the iPhone has a motion sensor, and it's getting more and more p uh, phones get this. I have actually no idea how this ends up, but the idea is kind of nice. So maybe if someone is bored, they're probably going to really implement it with a real device. Any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, if NFC would work out as a pairing mechanism. NFC will work out. NFC is actually quite nice and good enough. The only problem with NFC, it's still RFID. So if you think it only works in a distance of a centimeter or two, you're mistaken. If you put a big enough antenna on it, you can read it from a, a, a more wide dis, uh, distance. The second of all, getting devices with... Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until your talk. Uh, getting devices with NFC support. Nokia talks about NFC for um, paying with your mobile phone in uh, 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 trams or trains or whatever since two years. These devices never make it on the market so far. The chips, somehow they are, they are not good enough, but I haven't seen this making on the market. Yeah, I've, I've seen that model too, but... I never said they not exist, but they're not mass market. Nokia has one model. That's the only company that actually has a model. Okay, so. so actually, back to the near field communication, uh, there's no security. You can spoof it, you can clone it. And um, especially, I have one of these Nokia phones with an embedded um, uh, RFID reader, and this is just, uh, it's just the EEPROM reader. It's clear text, it's not encrypted, it's not secure, you can clone it, you can spoof it, and you can do anything with it. So, near field communication has to be done with the same type of security. You cannot uh, do it simple. Otherwise, I just clone your tag and get in and get the key. As I said, it's absolutely true, but we have to see how this works out and still people think more about usability than actually security. There was another question somewhere. Yes, please. Okay, uh, he, but there's no implementation in the stack whatsoever. Uh, there are prototypes of the stack which Microsoft and some other companies go testing with on the Unplug events which are covered by an NDA. Uh, I don't see anyone of getting out and say, okay, can we now do it. Apple said to me, no, we are busy. We are doing something else. The Linux implementation which I'm working on is, uh, yeah, it's not ready yet because there are too many factors I have to think about to get it right. And I don't want to push something that is half ready and basically someone comes along and does an audit on it and it breaks behind my back. Same goes for the other companies. They're really afraid and I haven't seen anything coming out and nobody has a commitment to 2.1. Neither an embedded device, neither an host stack somewhere. Everybody is working on it, but uh, the last things I heard, they're targeting end of next year to have them, which is actually kind of bad. Any other questions? And thanks from my side and I open the space for the next speaker.